$1.7 million worth of real estate and we got $10,000 in your savings account right now. Have to evict those tenants and then- I hate no interest rate credit cards. I hate buy now, pay later. I'm gonna have to argue and still fight you on the uh, credit cards. This can cost you over a million dollars over the course of your life. You know how many people with that trillion dollars probably signed up saying, hey, this is a 0% interest rate credit card. I'm gonna pay it off before the 12 months. That is not cheap debt right there. I think a lot of my issues came from Russia. The holes burned in their kitchen floors. So that means you're paying $341 to own that property. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that you opened my mind up to a couple of things. My name is Clay Bache Love, 27 years old. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And what do you do for work, Clay? Uh, so I'm an investor. I trade stocks, dividend paying stocks, and then I also have a real estate portfolio. And how long have you been doing that for? Last week made two years. So I've been having all this for two years. Trading stocks for two years as well as the real estate or have those been on different timelines? Uh, with the stocks, I've been, I got exposed to it in maybe middle school. But uh, as far as being at the level and uh, the method and strategies I'm going with now, I've been doing that about two years as well. And real estate, are these short-term or long-term rentals? I diversify portfolio. So uh, some of them is long-term, some of it is short-term. So it's a good mix. Awesome. And how much you make a year from... We'll start with trading stocks and how much you're from real estate. Um, from trading stocks passively, it's a couple thousand. Um, and uh, with real estate, it varies given that I have some short term. So sometimes it might be a ten or $15,000 a month. Other times it might be 10000 in like slower months. Uh, but all together included, I would say anywhere from around one hundred and fifty to 200000 total. $150,000 to $200,000 a year? Yes. Okay. And so- Trading stocks? Are you trading options? Are you day trading? So I buy all dividend paying stocks. Okay, so you're you're not you're not day trading or doing options. Yeah, so mainly I try to like stick in that realm of real estate. So I mainly buy REITs. Yeah, and I try to go with you know eleven percent returns. Um, there's a couple out there, so I try to stick with those. And so, what's your total yearly income from stock portfolio then? Uh, that right now is about twenty five hundred. You know, sometimes they do change the the amount they pay in the dividends. So, I mean- 2500 a month? Uh, No, not a month, I wish. Oh, a year. About 2000 yeah. Okay. I started slow with that and I was mainly investing in my real estate portfolio with real property. And then on, so $150,000 to $200,000 gross annual income accounting for af after all expenses or is that prior to maintenance, everything else with the properties? So that's prior to right now what I've okay. done. Yeah, I've been putting a lot of money back into it because I've been- uh fixing up all my properties with renovations. I actually just started a new project yesterday. So that means you're getting hammered with mortgage payments, with stuff breaking, with vacancies, everything else in between on top of that 150. Yeah. You know, some tenants are real creative when they get mad. So I, I had a friend that posted, he has some properties up in Minneapolis and has shared some videos of evictions and stuff from up there and has had tenants burn the floorboards has had tenants that look like they brought a dumpster in the house that he had to clean out once he finally got them evicted months after he had been trying to get them evicted. Um, so tenants can definitely do some damage to properties. Man, I got a couple of nightmares myself. We'll share that later in the in this show then. I want to definitely hit on some of the different nightmares of real estate. Because all people hear about is, hey, you're going to make $10,000 a month from your Airbnb. And they don't hear the eviction stories. They don't hear the nightmare stories. So... Great. So how would you define your current financial situation on a scale of one to 10? Um, if I could give it a one to 10, I think that I would go, I would say maybe a five to six range. Uh, I think I definitely could, you know, continue to expand. I had a couple of major mistakes that I made along the way. Um, some things that worked out in my favor all the way. So um, I would say about five or six. Okay. And what areas do you think you can improve mostly with your finances right now? I would say... It's more so a lot higher rates right now. And if I could have, you know, solidified better rates for myself, I think I'll be in a way better situation right now. But that's probably not going to change anytime soon. So um, the unfortunate side, you have no say in that. And uh, the Fed's Fed's in charge of that. Right. Uh, as far as what's in my control, I definitely do want to decrease some of the uh, smaller debts that I have right now. And I think that that would just give me better returns at the end of each month. So let's talk about current debts then. How many, how many properties do you have right now? I just bought my sixth one Monday. Your sixth? Yes. Oh, nice. Okay. So that means we got a lot of different debts with those. So let's go through them one by one. What what are your different debts? Um, do you want me to more so go in detail with the mortgages or like the renovations or regular maintenance? 
I want to hear anything you have about total debt. So if you have any loans out, whether it's mortgages, whether it's HELOCs, whether it's personal loans, I want to hear all of those. So I have a personal loan. That's a big one that I have. I took a personal loan out to do an ADU, um, and that ADU currently it, w it started off at ninety thousand. Then it went to uh, it's currently at sixty seven as of today. That didn't include appliances or furniture, you know, to rent that out short term. How much is that ADU bringing in a month right now? Um, well, right now because I'm doing renovations on uh, the house I just bought Monday. I'm living in this, so it's not bringing in anything. Okay, so you're living in that ADU now right now. Okay. And that monthly payment, it looks like, is $1,900? $1,953. And that's an interest rate of 15.69%. Yeah. It's, that is not cheap debt right there. Not at all. I mean, if I would have had a rate that would have been, you know, 5, 10, or something like that, a lot better. I mean, my numbers would be crazy right now. I probably would have had the loan paid off. Yeah. I don't even want to see the interest versus principal payment on that every single month. I'm sure it's... Sure, it's not pretty. Super disrespect. What um, what term is that on? Um, that was a five year term. So uh, the end of October will make. Uh, I'll have forty eight months left. Okay, so you're about a year into it then. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I have five years, but I paid extra a lot of months. Okay. Just to get ahead. Okay, I was gonna say because this calculator is showing me it'd be about around seventy five thousand at the end of year one. But you're a little bit ahead of that, so you're paying extra toward it. That's that's good. That's good. Yeah. So uh, before I moved into this uh, this rental, it was you know making money. So since it was making money in my other properties, everything was fully occupied at the time. I said, okay, I have this extra money. Let me pay this off. So that way, you know, it'll help my credit for one, help my debt to income ratio, and you know my numbers will be better at it each month. Yeah. So how much was that bringing in prior to you moving into it? The second I finished the garage. The second I listed it on Airbnb, it got booked out for about two months. Uh, so it was making 3000 the first two months. Some months it made like 5000 5000 So it was doing pretty good numbers. So, I mean, I was just putting all that extra money towards paying it off. Nice. Okay. So it, that's definitely helping you there if you're clearing three to 5000 Obviously, you need to account for some maintenance and stuff with that, but that gives you enough wiggle room in there to clear, clear some. Okay. So that's the first step we have, personal loan for the ADU. Let's go through the other loans you got then. So uh, I well, if I can start with, uh, I got myself in this good position because the first house that I ever bought, purchased, um, it had multiple houses on it. It has excessive land on it. And then I was able to build this ADU on it. Um, given that, that gave me a place to live for myself, a place to rent out. Um, and the interest rate was like 2%. So, I mean, everything was perfect. Um, took that opportunity and I was able to renovate and um, rent it out and make, I was making about with the first house, like eight to 10,000 a month. And I had a 2% interest rate. My mortgage was initially like 2,200. So it paid for the renovations, uh, extra money towards the principal and all that. So it kind of put me in a good position with the other properties I bought. The rates have been high Yeah, um, with my favor and against me it works in my favor. Cause I got a good deal and I walked in with equity. Uh, the bad side is for what I can rent it at right now, it's not the biggest profit margin there. So I secured the property and another one and another one and another one, but I just have low profit margins on those right now until yeah. I can refinance, which- Which who knows what that's gonna be. Right, so that's so, kind of here now to see what I can do better. Yes, so that first property that you had the ADU on, you said 2% mortgage rate on it. What's the total balance what was the original loan amount for? Four hundred and seventy thousand. And you know what the balance is on is right right now? I want to say maybe high threes right now. I was put three nineties. That sound about right? Yeah, that sounds about right. And your monthly, you said about two something interest rate twenty. Um, so that changed as well, which also threw my profit margins off. So I bought in an area. Uh, I'm from LA originally. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know I was buying in like a more rural area. But they started developing so much over here that my taxes went up an extra eleven hundred. So that twenty two turned to thirty two. That's a steep tax bill going up. Yeah, they. Uh, I mean, across the street from me, and I bought while I was in California, so I didn't know anything about the area or anything like that. Um, when I first purchased this home, across the street from me was a forest. It was nothing but trees everywhere. Um, I deployed for a year, came back home. It's like million dollar houses all across the street from me, which works in my favor because. It brought the property value up in the entire neighborhood, but it worked against me as far as bringing up the tax rate in the entire neighborhood as well. Yeah. That that's what people don't see with home ownership. Same thing happened to me. Twelve months after I moved in my house, got my annual assessment, and uh, tax bill went up 
$3,500 for the year. So extra 300 something dollars a month about, and um, had to pay that. So that's what, what people don't see. And it's like, you got to have that. It has to be ready for that. Your escrow payments did not cover that and they want their money. So you got to pay $3,000 for the last 12 months. And then you got to pay a couple hundred extra dollars every two months moving forward. So, right. And that's, that's kind of what it had me in. And then once again, it worked in my favor and worked against me. Um, when the tax first in, the taxes first increased in my area, um, and it hit my mortgage statement, I had two long-term tenants. Um, at the time, I had really great profits. I mean, um, if I remember off the top of my head, I was getting over three thousand a month profit just from that that first purchase. And then after the taxes went up, I mean, and I did renovations, and then I got two vacancies at the same time. <laughs> Life is no, numbers shift quickly on that. So. That property close to three ninety on the balance. Original loan was four seventy. Monthly payments now about thirty two hundred dollars. What is it currently rent for a month right now? Um, I have one tenant paying twenty seven hundred. Uh, one is on Airbnb. Uh, it was earlier this week, maybe Monday or Tuesday. They booked it for about a month, so the rate that they're paying is just under three thousand. This like uh, I want to say like high twenty sevens. And is that what you receive after Airbnb fees? Yes, that's, so that's after Airbnb. Brought about fifty four hundred. I'm going to be in this uh, third unit on this property till about uh, the end of this week. Then I'll move into my house. They should be done with renovation. Okay, so you should bring in another two thousand dollars a month conservatively with the ADU, if not more. Correct. So uh, I actually did a couple property tours today earlier um, in the afternoon time. Um, some people are looking to go at around twenty five hundred on Section Eight. So I mean that'll you know hit my market. Uh, margins that I'm looking for uh, and, and leave a little bit extra. Okay. So you think you'll be able to rent that out for 2,500, the other two, 2,700. So that brings rental income to about $7,900 per month for that property that has three different units on it? Correct. Okay. So I guess you'll have between loan payments, the personal loan and the original loan property taxes, about $5,100 in mortgage payments there. So it leaves you just under $3,000, which definitely will account for maintenance repairs and some cushion on top of that. So, Right, right. To be able to have my entire everything that I need paid for completely. So I want to be able to have enough profits coming to pay off this property itself, as well as mom living, you know, with money for utilities and whatnot like that. Okay. So let's go to property number two. Uh, property number two was uh, in Decatur. So right now, uh, those tenants, they pay 2,600 a month. Uh, I worked to deal with them. So I actually purchased the home and as I was in, you know, under contract to buy it, I had my real estate agent do a property tour with them so they can rent it. Um, I was looking to get at least 3000 for that house. Cause it was a brand new house built last year. I ended up, uh, saying, Hey, look, if you guys come right now with the deposit, I'll, I'll give you guys a deal. You guys have to sign for three years. I want to put the rental increase in your lease. So that way, you know, the increase is coming. You're locked in to paying off a couple of years, which I expected in maybe a three year time frame. I can um, refinance and have a lower monthly payment. Um, so the mortgage there is twenty three seventy nine, and they are paying twenty six hundred. Their rental increase comes October so next week. OK, and increasing at 10 percent. So it'll increase two hundred sixty dollars. OK, so go to two eight six zero basically in a few weeks. And what's the interest rate and what's the loan amount for that one? That is 6.9 interest rate, 6.99. And what was the original loan balance? Uh, 318. I'm assuming that hasn't gone down probably but $6,000 over the last year, six or $10,000. Well, I paid a little bit extra. I actually used their deposit, to be honest. Okay. Um, I used their deposit to um, get ahead on the payment, um, which they're not getting their deposit back because they did pay late just about every month. And that's came from that. I sent them a notice saying that, you know, this is going to be drawn from your deposit. So, um, and they agreed to it. So, uh, right now it's, I believe it said like something. Okay. Nice. So you're making, you're making progress on it then. Correct. Okay. Any, too much work and renovations or anything like that at all. So, okay. And then property number three, property number three is at, <laughs> it's, I want to say six point something as well um it might be 6.2 or 3 um that's in texas it's in uh Killeen, texas near the army base so uh my strategy with that was more so get uh you know military people have to pay and if not their their unit or their command can get involved and make them have to pay it. and their checks are regular and stable and secure you know through the government yeah so i figured that i would have always guaranteed tenants 
it's always people that are going to have to live in this area if they get stationed there. Um, I do have a property management, so that's an extra bill for that. Um, they get 10%. Uh, those tenants are actually paying, they pay about sixteen fifty. Um, the property management gets 10%, so about one sixty five. Um, leads me around what a little bit Four, over fourteen eighty five. There we go. Um the mortgage there is actually eighteen twenty six. The time of me buying that once again, my other properties were just doing so well that it covered for that. And my strategy for that was, you know, secure the properties while the rates are high and people aren't buying. And then when I refinance, if I've been able to manage it all this time, it'll just increase my profit margin later. And in this case, I'll begin to profit more and rent increases every year. So that was my strategy when I uh, purchased that property. Okay. So you're going into this with a long-term refining strategy versus, hey, I don't need to cash flow out, out the door. Correct. Uh, okay. And what was the loan balance, original loan balance on that property? Uh, that was two fifteen. dollars um, So I got it for two fifteen. dollars um, I got that one um, also about a year ago. So uh, the next, those are the last two houses I talked about. I got a month apart. Um, so, I mean, that one hasn't went down too much. I haven't paid anything extra on it. And then property number four. Property number four. So that is the one that I just got uh, earlier this week. Actually, so like I said, the first property is three houses on that right now. Yeah. Uh, so it's almost like a triplex, but it's three separate houses. Yeah, three, on three units on it. Yeah. Um, so the, the one, the last house right now, the one I bought this earlier this week, which is, um, that's going to be for me to live in. So that's not profiting at all. Okay. And what's the per the, purchase price of that? Um, I got that one for 215 as well. 215? Yes. Okay. And how much did you put down on that? So what's the loan balance? I put down 10, uh, just under 11,000. It was like 10, 900 or something, somewhere around there. So your loan balance about 204,000? Correct. And what's the interest rate on that? That is 7.3. So your monthly payment, including property taxes, insurance, what is that? 19. 1900? Correct. Um, that doesn't include all the renovations that they started the, this week. Though. And I don't have that number yet just because uh, they're still picking up supplies and materials. Do you know, Ballpark, how much you're spending on that? Um, based off of the quotes that I got, I have working with two different contractors. One is going to like clear out the trees. This house sits on the lake. So uh, we're going to do a lot to the backyard as far as clean out all the trees. So that way um, we can see, have a clear view from the back porch to the lake. Um, he quoted me. 7,000 to take out all the trees. And um, the other contractor is working on the inside. He quoted me 8,000 for labor. I'm estimating about another 10,000 for material. So what is that? 18 plus seven. 25. Um, 5,000 extra. Um, okay. I want to be on payment plans with that. I'm thinking maybe about a year. So that 25 divided by 12. Um, I'm not sure what that number is. Are you paying out a personal loan for this? Or are you working out a payment plan with these contractors? I'm, I'm working out a payment plan with the contractors. I worked with them on my other houses. So they're giving me, you know, deals off of uh, past history and relationships we established. And then as far as materials and labor, or sorry, as far as materials go, um, I'm going to Lowe's and they got 12% no interest. The good old 12 months, no interest car cards. There we go. That's been the way I've been doing it. I'm not a fan of those, but we'll get into that later. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. We'll get about that. I got to see why. We'll, we'll talk about it. I mean, the, the rundown typically is life happens. So I'm not a fan of buy now, pay later because life happens. Expenses come up and you're tied to these payments. And then sounds great. Zero percent interest rate. But guess what? Month 11, your AC unit is going to go out and you need to spend that last $10,000 on a new AC unit. And that one starts accruing 25% interest rates on it. So um, not a fan of that because people find themselves in a cycle of buy now, pay later, whether it's with some like Klarna on buying dresses or buying stuff on the internet or on Amazon or credit cards. Hey, I'm going to go finance a $50,000 bathroom renovation at Home Depot, but I'll pay off in 12 months. But then the car breaks down month eight and they got to go buy another car. Um, so I see, I see what you're saying there. And, um, I actually do have an Amazon card too. And that's how I furnished my places. You know, I got everything delivered, set it up with Amazon and had those 12 months, no interest. But more so for me, the reason why I think it's been able to work is because uh, given that I'm using these houses to make the money, I can't make that money until the house is in good condition, furnished or, you know, whatever, if I'm doing a short term rental. So I'm using these uh, no interest payments and then kind of factoring that in like, hey, it might be around an extra five or 600 a month. You know, as long as there's no interest and I make, meet that minimum on the months where I do better in profits at the end of the month. OK, I pay more if it went kind of slow that month. You know, I can, you know, be closer to the minimum. I try to pay it off as soon as I can. So that way I don't run 
into those unforeseen. Yeah. And, and I, and I definitely get trying to leverage yourself and, um, I'm a much more conservative person than I prefer not to do that. And I have friends that have done all sorts of creative financing with buying rental properties, with um, buying different things. And I just prefer, I think my risk tolerance is just definitely a lot lower because I've seen also what can happen if you do leverage yourself. I'm just a lot more conservative on that front. So, but I definitely understand like the, hey, if I can finance something at $2,000 and I can have a Delta margin for $1,000 that, that month or whatever it is, then it sounds good, but then also life can also happen and it can also hurt you at the same time. So, okay. So these are the four different properties we have right now, three units on one, and then we have three other units. So you got six total rental property units for about $1.1 million in debt. Does that sound about right? Just about. Okay. And what would you put the total value of all those properties combined at? That That's kind of harder to say. Uh, give me a second. Um, it's just that I did renovations to just about all of them. Yep. Uh, so after renovations, um, let me kind of work with the first one. With the first house that has three on it, three buildings on it, um, let's add a hundred thousand for the garage that I put up, you know, the hundred thousand into it. The area went up and appreciated as well. Um, like I said, that those that tax increase of eleven hundred dollars or so. I would say that first property, I would say about eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred, okay. You know, given the renovations to the pool and everything else that's been done, uh, eight hundred. The second one, uh, they initially were selling that for four hundred thousand. I I really analyzed the market when I was like making that purchase, and I feel like I really came up on a good deal. So they were selling it for four hundred. I got it for three eighteen, and it's been about a year. I would say that the area has still increased and went up over there as well. So I would put that at maybe like we can say maybe like four twenty four thirty to be conservative. The Texas house, I don't think that that's really an appreciating area like that right now. It's a a lot slower in, in clean Texas. I, I would say that that might be just around like maybe two thirty. The that I just purchased, the whole area is at two sixty. The guy was selling that house for two sixty. I just got it for two fifteen. Um, once I'm done with all the renovations, um, I would say it would be about three hundred thousand. I'm doing a lot of work to that house. Okay, I'll give you about three thousand when I'm done. I would say if you bought it for two fifteen and you're putting twenty five into it, jumping it up to three hundred thousand might be a little bit of a stretch. Um, off the bat, but I'd put it, I'm more conservative. So <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's probably safer in, in the best bet. Um, I just think that, uh, it's, it's like a huge lake on it. The way they were selling it, you can't see the lake from your back porch. I actually, um, quick, funny story. When I was buying the house and I went to go do the tour with my agent, me nor my agent seen the lake in the backyard. Like, we didn't even know it had a lake because there was so many trees, but if I can cut those down for six, 7,000, and it's a clear path, well lit. Uh, I built a dock on there. I think that that'll really bring it up a lot because, you know, people love the fish. The neighbors actually just filled up the whole lake with a lot more fish. Um, so I think that's going to really bring up the value too. And in that whole little community around that lake, no HOA either. Okay, nice. I'll, I'll, I'll meet you in the middle. I'll put it 265 to 270. We could do that. Okay. So that brings property value 1.72 between the personal loan and the mortgages you got 1.167 million in debt on those do we have any other debts um no that's no everything debt. well let's talk about the amazon card you said you have an amazon card that you have 12 months no purchase how many how many of those credit cards do we have right now and what's the balance on them? so on the amazon i paid that off uh good so um yeah that's free and clear now i do have a lowe's card right now um, the Lowe's has 8,000 on it. Uh, and that's, like I said, we still got to buy a few more materials. So let's say we get about another 10,000 in materials. So that'll be about 18,000. And is that 0% interest rate right now? Correct. And how long does that last for? Um, I bought in bulk with the different purchases that I was making. Um, so one of the payments is about 2,000 or 3,000 needs to be paid off in March. Um, April, I have about 2,000. Um, so let's say that's five. And then I think the last one is June of next year. Okay. So there's some time on those right now. Okay. Okay. And no other credit cards? Uh, actually, yeah, I just got engaged too. So I spent a little bit of money on this ring. Uh, we're not mine, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> my fiance's ring um her ring was about 4500 what's the interest rate on engagement rings um i use my personal credit card oh so you're sending out like a 28 percent interest rate on that um well if i pay make the payments on on that card i'll be good so it's zero, uh, it's zero percent right now no that's not at zero percent that's i just paid okay. it flat out 45 okay um, well you know i paid it on my credit card so as long as i pay that by 
we just got engaged. As long as I pay that by uh, the end of October, I'm good. Okay. Well, let's let's do that because the worst thing you want to do is be financing and paying twenty percent on your engagement ring because I'll hurt looking at it. Yeah, literally. Um, oh, okay. So, any other any other debts there? Uh, that's everything. No school debt. Uh, no car no, loan. Mm, cars paid off. Right, good. Okay. Now let's talk about assets. We just talked about the value of the homes. So one point seven two on that. What other? Do we have any investments, savings? Uh, my stock portfolio, the value of that is around like fifteen thousand. Um, if I were to sell like everything in it today, um, and like I said, that profits. What is it? Uh, I don't know what that monthly might be if you divide that number. It, it's making money from there too. And then any in savings? Um, in the savings, I have about ten ten thousand, and I should be getting about another three thousand uh, or so from tenants paying. Uh, what they owe for this month with the late fees and everything included per day. That means total assets between stock portfolio, savings and properties, 1.74 million. We've got total debts of $1,179,500, which brings your net worth to $565,500. That sound about right? That sounds about right. And you're 27 years old. <laughs> I would definitely want to talk about how do we improve this further because some of this scares me a little bit. Um, but the the loans, mainly the personal loan, the credit cards, and the engagement ring is what kind of scares me right now. But um, done a good job with some of these rental properties. Definitely your first property with that interest rate and getting in there and renting it out. Once you move out, having eight thousand dollars in income coming in from that will be will be great. So uh, let's talk about your current monthly expenses then. So we just went through all of that. We already have all the mortgage payments having in here. Um, you put in your budget eleven thousand two hundred seventy nine for rent slash or for mortgage, and then nine hundred for maintenance. Is that including? Did you just put all your rental properties in there, basically? Well, at the yes, uh, so I did that, and then those numbers might be a little bit off because uh, they were playing around with the closing disclosures uh, up until the moment of me getting to the table. So I seen the rates were fluctuating. I was hard to get in contact with my loan officer to say what's going on. So I did want to get as close to accurate information to you, but some Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's plus or minus $50. It looks like it should be, or a hundred dollars. And then home maintenance, is that just what you're kind of estimating every single month for maintenance for your properties? Yeah. The renovations, uh, maintenance pool. And what do you calculate that based off of? Um, so that's if I were to try to, uh, pay everything off before those, uh, before it starts having that interest on those no interest credit cards. Um, and that's like, you know, overestimating too, just to make sure like I'm not pushing it close. You know, okay, so that doesn't actually include, hey, AC goes out six months from now, I'm saving $900 a month towards this. This is just current expenses. Correct. Um, however, I do got to add in, I do have home warranties on all my house. Per year you're paying that? Or is that just like for the first year or two? That's for the first year or two, but I bought all these houses in about a year and a half. Okay. So you, you're covered right now then? Correct. Okay. And then we got auto and transport. We have zero for car payment, gas, $200. What's your car insurance a month? Honestly, I don't even know. And I know that sounds so bad to say. I, I didn't want to just lie and say a number, but all my home insurances are through the, uh, I got USA and I do a bundle. So, I mean, everything's kind of like really wrapped in one. Okay. I'll put I'll put one. My wife and I we paid about two hundred and five dollars a month for both of us. So I'll put you at like a hundred and five groceries, six hundred dollars a month. <laughs> a lot of food there for one person. Is this just for you, or is that including the fiance too? Uh, honestly, that was just included me. That was okay. Okay. <laughs> then we got eating out two hundred dollars, entertainment eight hundred dollars a month. You spend on entertainment. You know, I figured maybe two hundred a weekend if you go out and. You know, do something. I feel like spending it in Atlanta. Going to the clubs and getting bottle service stuff, you can. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess I'm, I'm excited to dive into these monthly transactions here in a second then. And they got personal care, $200 a month. Uh, you know, haircuts and stuff like that. You, you think get a $200 haircut? You just need a set of razors for your hair right there. If I go, uh, uh, you know, tip, so about 50 I go to great clubs. It's like $20 plus like a 5 to $7 tip. And I'm out the door under $30. I might need to find a new barber. So that brings total fund money, twelve hundred dollars a month. If we get rid of if we get rid of the other rental properties and just include the one you're moving into, which is nineteen hundred dollars a month, your total necessity is about thirty seven hundred dollars plus twelve hundred in fund money brings you total expenses about forty nine hundred dollars. If we include all the rental property payments, you're about fourteen thousand dollars a month. Your entertainment is definitely a little bit high, and I'd presume as we go through some of these transactions, you're probably gonna be 
filling up some of these other categories like the shopping or health and fitness or gifts or subscriptions that are not currently on this budget sheet. Yeah, I actually, so the last month or so, I've been traveling uh, back and forth to LA, Ohio, mm -hmm. and you know, obviously Atlanta too. So I've been in like a different state every week for like the last month, I believe. Let's, let's take it back a few years now and talk about college. You go to college? I actually just graduated last week. With nice, congrats. Yeah, thanks. What'd you study? Uh, I got my MBA. Nice, okay. And would you, would you? There's in uh, communications. Bachelor in communications? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you also said you went to, you're in the army? Correct. Okay, nice. Well, first, thank you for your service. Did you go into the army for four years after graduation? I graduated 2018, so five years. So I got a little bit left, 12 months uh, left. Okay, so you still have 12 months left on your service then? Correct. And what, why'd you go get your MBA? Honestly, I, 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 was, I started when I was deployed and I figured it'd be you know, keep me busy. Uh, I gave my GI bill tuition assistance. So I figured it would pay me at the same time. But now that I graduated, I can't really count that as an income anymore, but I didn't put me in any debt either. Okay. So they, they paid for your education for you to put. Nice. I mean, that's great to take advantage of those. You deserve it for serving our country. So thank you for that. And good job for you for taking full advantage of those opportunities to you. What are, what are your future career goals? Honestly, I, me and my fiance wanted to start our own anime. Um, uh, right here, I published a book um, a couple months ago. So this is the nice. uh, thing. I'm working on another book now, and that's going to be more so focused on REITs uh, and like how people can scale and grow with that. Um, it does take a good amount of money to get where you can retire with REITs, but having that, the real property, and then, you know, military retirement as well, that'll be, you know, multiple streams right there. So that's kind of my plan. And then I act. And you act too. Beautiful. So when you finish your six years in service, will you get military retirement immediately or how does that work? Really, that'll give me tax exemption on my property. So if I put that on where it went up $1,100 and I'm not paying no taxes on that property, my numbers will be amazing. 2% interest rate, no taxes, no PMI. Uh, yeah, I, I'll be living really comfortable. Do you know what income you'd be receiving from that about? Um, just roughly about 4000 a month. I'm tax free, but I'm also not paying vehicle taxes, property taxes. So, I mean, that's the big benefit right there too. And uh, what financial goals do you have just moving forward for career wise or just in general? Um, so initially a few years ago, I asked myself this and I said about 10,000. Um, now looking to, you know, have a fiance and, you know, kids someday, I think maybe like extra fifth, five or like 10,000 would be good. Okay. And is that, are you saying total rental income or are you saying after all expenses? After expenses. So you want to get 15K a month after all expenses? Correct. I think that's a great, great goal to have. <laughs> yeah. If I can say I'm saving a good 15,000, I know, I, I mean, I'm pretty much good with whatever I want to do. I feel like I'm more so conservative when it comes to going yeah. out and having fun. So I don't know. You're spending $800 a month on entertainment. So I don't know. I'd call that conservative when I'm going out and having fun and spending $800 a month. I think my entertainment budget last month was $0. I think that's, that's conservative. Yeah, but I spent all my money on food and travel. So I guess travel is somewhat of entertainment. Oh, yeah. Nah, I've got to travel. That's definitely like a good opportunity. Okay. Well, let's talk about childhood. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in South Central LA. Okay. And what was your childhood like growing up in LA? I think it was uh, kind of like a rich dad, poor dad situation almost. You know, I seen certain people in my family doing this, some people doing this. And then I kind of made my own lane based upon that. But my family was real big on finances and like everybody pretty much has rental properties or business of their own in my family. Nice. And how did your parents approach money growing up? Uh, my mom, see, my, I felt like my mom had the fun side of it. Like she would go out and do different things. So I seen that got to live your life from my mom. My dad, it's like, I mean, he would just talk my head off about business all day, every day. So, I mean, I felt like I got a good balance there. And that's uh, pretty much how they went about it. All right. So you have both sides. You got the mom side, it's been $800 a month entertainment. You got the dad side trying to build a real estate empire. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. So it sounds, sounds like your dad talked to you a lot about money growing up. Yeah, a whole lot. Um, he would take me around to see his properties and how he's renovating them. And, you know, just, I mean, he would just talk. Oh. What do you, what would you say are the number one or number two financial lessons that you kind of learned from your parents as you grew up? Um, I would say my dad taught me that you have to leverage. That was his biggest thing. I would say if I had to estimate, um, I would say my dad's net worth is probably like 3.9, um, with his real estate portfolio. Um, and he learned from like our, well, his grandma, my great grandma, her real estate portfolio is like through the sky. Like it's, she has a lot. 
like all over, like everywhere. So, I mean, hers is up there. So, I mean, learning from like my dad's side of the family, I would say leveraging and, you know, scale. Uh, my mom, she more so taught me the short-term rental game. Everybody on my dad's side did long-term. So I think from my mom, she taught me, you know, having that balance with work and play and then also diversifying your portfolio. Okay. Yeah, definitely diversifying the portfolio and I think some people take the leveraging a little bit too far. For example, yeah, if you're leveraging two or three percent interest rate mortgage loans back in 2020, 2021 on rental properties and are cash from day one, yeah, you could probably leverage that to the moon and be as long as you're putting 20, 25 percent down, probably be okay for majority of your life. But if we're leveraging ourselves with HELOCs with personal loans at 15% and continue to do that for eternity, someone's gotta gotta catch at some point because 15% interest rates, you're not gonna typically beat that with long-term. You're not gonna be that with long-term rentals. And short-term rentals, you're playing a very interesting game that could all come crashing down if the city passes an ordinance against Airbnbs or your property tax bill goes up or for some reason something happens to the town or hurricane comes in and something happens. But um, I definitely understand like the leveraging side of real estate, but doing it a conservative way with if there's low interest rate loans or if you're buying properties that you're cash on them from day one and setting aside reserves for it. But that's what I want to kind of talk about because I want to talk about with you kind of your current portfolio. Uh, this is a lot of fun having someone with $1.7 million worth of real estate on the show. First time I've had someone with this much real estate come on here and um, definitely shows a different side of what is possible out there. Would love to kind of talk about I'll kind of give you my first initial feedback on what I think about your current situation, and then we'll kind of have a discussion from there. But I mean, initially, primary property, your first one, that's still three units, monthly payment, $3,200. Right now, just running out to your having $5,400 in monthly income, which is great. In my opinion, whether it's long-term properties or short-term, is like you need to have cash reserves for vacancies, for capital expenditures, for maintenance. And a lot of people say you should set aside like 10% for each of those, 30% of your total income. Um, if you want to be a gr or less conservative, and more aggressive, maybe it's 20%, but you just need to make sure, because guess what? In those properties, tenants are going to leave it like trash or they're going to break something or the AC unit is going to go out or a new roof. And if you're spending the entire $2,200 a month right now without setting aside at least like a thousand dollars a month for when stuff's inevitably going to break, then you're going to find yourself leveraging credit cards when that does happen. Um, but when you do move out and you have that ADU being rented out. I mean, you're going to be bringing in $7,900, but between your mortgage payment and the personal loan, you're going to be about $5,200. So that will give you about $2,700 a month cash flow from that perspective, not accounting for vacancies or maintenance. Um, so it increases that buffer. But again, I would still be figuring out, and that's what you got to figure out yourself. If I was in your shoes, I mean, I've, I've been looking at a lot of different real estate properties the last year with my wife, just running the numbers and looking at them because I'm trying to learn more about real estate, uh, wanting into real estate one day, but with the way current interest rates are, and I run them very conservatively when I run it because I want to make sure I'm accounting for 10% vacancies because if someone, a tenant leaves and they're gone for six weeks, guess what? 10% of the year of your income is gone. And you have a management company, that's another 10%. And you need to account for capital expenditures and maintenance. Typically, whether you're living in a primary residence or rental property, either go the one to two percent of the home value every single year it needs to be stocked away. That's what I do for my primary residence, is I stock away about one percent of the home value in a savings account every single month because something's gonna break. Nine months after we moved in, we had a three thousand dollar new water pipe because the water pipe started leaking. I had five thousand gallons of water somewhere under my house and the water bill was just running, running up. So guess what? I had to spend three thousand dollars getting a water pipe, and that's not something I would have predicted. But since I'm saving hundreds of dollars a month for a sinking fund for that, guess what? That happens in six months from now. Yeah, I'm gonna be pissed that I gotta spend a couple thousand dollars on something, but I've been saving away for that for the last however long since I started, since I moved in here and set that account up. Same thing with rental properties as well as primary residences. If something's gonna break, a water pipe's gonna break, AC unit, roof, you need to make sure that you're setting aside money for that. Same with vacancies, because like you said, you had a situation, you had two vacancies at the exact same time. That's the worst thing to happen is when you got a multifamily property and both units are vacant at the same time, because that's not like you can barely cover any of your mortgage. It's like you got to cover the entire thing yourself. So what I'd like you to be doing is send aside money every single month. And this is not going into, Hey, I'm going to go spend this on entertainment, or I'm not going to go travel with this. This is, Hey, this is for a rainy day when stuff's going to happen. So first property, I do like that it is going to be cash flowing. I don't like the 15% personal loan because 15% returns your stock portfolio right now. You said you're trying to get 11% in your REITs. You're not even earning what this interest on this loan is. 
And some people would tell you, hey, you should sell your stock portfolio and use that to pay towards the balance because you're going to essentially earn 15% guaranteed return on that money instead of your stock portfolio, which is definitely a route to go. Um, I can't convince you to do one way or the other, but that's definitely an option I look at and say, okay, do I want to pay this off or part of this off with my stock portfolio? Yes, you're going to have to pay capital gains taxes. Yes, you're going to not have 11% or 5% or whatever your returns are on that investments for the next year or two, but you're going to have a guaranteed 15.69% return because you just pay down your balance that much. Right. Now, that's a really good point. Act. I like that a lot. That, that's, that's something to consider. And frankly, with an interest rate that high, it's something I'd probably consider doing um, because you're not going to get 15% risk-free returns in real estate, in the stock market, in whatever it is. And you, right now you have a guaranteed 15.6% rate of interest rate that you're paying to the bank. So that's something that will help you pay that off quicker. And again, just something to do. Because if you get that paid off, I mean, your, your cash on that property goes from... $2,700 to $4,700, again, before accounting for maintenance for capital expenditures and vacancy. But I mean, you just open up your cash flow to $2,000 a month there, um, which will help put you in a lot more stable financial position. So that's what I was trying to, or not trying to, but currently getting annually just about. So, I mean, that does make a lot more sense. Definitely something, definitely something to consider. That'd be my suggestion with the primary residence is you got to figure out how to pay this 15% interest rate loan as quickly as possible off. Property number two, we do have $2,600 in monthly rental income. Monthly payment is $2,379. So you have a little over $200 a month in buffer. And then the rental increase. Yep. So, okay. So you got the rental increase. So we'll, we'll just go ahead and mark that up because by the time this podcast goes out, you're going to be getting $260 more a month. So that definitely pad your margins a little more, 481 after you count for your monthly payment on the property. So that leaves you with 481. Um, but again, that's not accounting for maintenance, for capital expenditures, for reserves. I'd be putting aside at least, in my opinion, at least 20% because 10% for vacancy, 10% for maintenance and capital expenditures. If you, Again, you want to be more conservative up to 30% when you can. I'd definitely go even that far. But I'd be putting at least 20% away, and that would be $572 a month. It wouldn't be cash flow at that point um, because you only have 40, $481 in buffer on that. So I'd be stocking away that entire $481 into an account that you can't touch, high yield savings account, and just be saving up funds. And when you get to, say, six months, you have six months of mortgage payments saved up for each property or whatever your amount is. Maybe it's $10,000 per property, maybe it's $15,000 for the bigger one. But then it's like, okay, now I have. Total amount. I mean, your monthly payments right now across everything is eleven thousand dollars. Maybe you get fifty thousand dollars, so it's five to six months of an emergency fund saved up for everything. Then everything on top of that, hey, you can start investing, start saving, whatever, start spending. But until you get there, you need to have an emergency fund because you got one point seven million dollars worth of real estate, and we got ten thousand dollars in your savings account right now. That is that is two AC units going out, even one AC unit, and your savings is depleted. And we haven't even talked about the ring, paying the ring off yet, so your savings should be less than that. So that's my biggest concern looking at this right now is we have to be saving for rainy. Yes, right now, leveraging yourself, you have the home warranties on it for the first year or two. Yes, nothing's brick, nothing's gone sideways, but with real estate, something's going to go south at some point. Long term, you should be okay, but something's going to go sideways at some point, whether it's a tenant, whether it's AC unit, roof again, and... You just have to make sure you're saving yourself for a rainy day on that. The third unit or the third property, that is what I don't like. I do not like this one at all, quite frankly. Um, I definitely understand the thesis of, hey, let's go buy a property right near a military base. That military base isn't moving. It's going to have consistent tenants. But right now, basically, your rental income after your property manages is $1,485. You are paying $1,826 a month. So that means you're paying... $341 to own that property. You're not receiving $341. You're paying $341 a month. That is not even accounting for vacancy. That's not accounting for capital expenditures. So if we accounted for an extra $300 a month or $200 a month for those, I mean, you're paying $550 a month at least to own that property. At $6,000 a year, you're paying for someone to live there. If you do a cash on cash return on anything, that doesn't look promising. That's one of the issues I've had when I've looked at properties, and it is a lot, honestly, because housing prices soared with low interest rates. Now interest rates have risen. We got 7% interest rates on properties that are not cash flowing. I mean, houses in different areas. I was looking at the other day, you could rent a house in the neighborhood for $3,500, but if you buy it, you're paying $5,000 out the door because of interest rates, because of property tax, because of everything. I was like, that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to go buy a property for five, pay $5,000 a month to put someone in there for 
$3,500 a month, I'd be paying someone $1,500 a month to live there. And that doesn't make sense. So this property, not the prettiest site. And I don't know what the strategy is, if there's an opportunity to raise the rental income anytime soon on that. But that is definitely something I would look at out of these three properties is if one had to go, if you have equity in there, that could be an option you look at, but I don't want you to be holding this on for three years, four years, five years and saying, oh, rental, pri rental prices only go up. And five years from now, you've paid out $6,000 a year because of maintenance, because of uh, vacancies for someone to live in there for last five years. And then you decide, hey, I'm going to sell it. Um, because then when you sell it, you're then going to incur six to 8% of closing costs and everything else in between. And that's just going to hurt you even further. So um, what not? when I'm looking at real estate, when I'm um, just trying to learn about it is like, I want to cash flow from day one, because if I'm not cash flowing from day one, there's no guarantees that I'm going to be able to refinance it down the line. There's no guarantees that I'm going to be able to increase the rent next year. And I've gone through these, my brother and I have looked at a lot of different properties together and he'll send me different stuff. I'll run a bunch of numbers on it. And again, I'm, I'm very conservative when I run it. I want to make sure that when there's no tenant in there that I have the reserve saved or when something breaks, I have the reserve saved. So when I run it, I'm running at 30% typically for maintenance, capital expenditures and for um, vacancy. And also if I don't want to manage it, property manager. So out of the door, you're gone 40% of your rental income. So you really got to have a buffer there and um, just something to look at and consider. And when it comes to real estate investing, a lot of people say, hey, I, just, I only care about appreciation. And some people go that route. But when it comes to me, if I can put my money with where interest rates are right now in a C that's earning 5.5% with little risk or in a high yield savings account, that's $250,000 FDIC insured for four and a half to 5%. And there's no risk with that versus, hey, I'm going to go put in a property that I'm paying someone to live in there. I'm going to pick parking my money in a high yield savings account all day. Property number three, I don't, I'm not a fan of. Um, property number four, your new primary residence. I was kind of scared because I was when you said you bought a primary residence, I was scared for what the price was going to be on it but it turned out to be one of the smaller properties, which is great. Um, so your monthly payment on that $1,900, I'm not too worried about that in terms of total housing payment, because I think you can be in a spot where that doesn't matter when we clear some of this debt off and you're right. able to, to enjoy life. And by moving into this property that's $1,900 at ADU, once that's paid off is essentially going to be paying for your housing expense. Um, so the other thing is the interest rates. Obviously, can you think about interest rates right now between six and seven percent? That's where they are, where they're probably going to be. The Fed's probably going to hike rates again this year. They think, or they've motioned towards that's probably what the reality is going to be. You also don't want to debate or depend on, hey, I want these rates to come down on refinance them down the line because there's no guarantees with that. So, um, property number one, I love that. Once we get this personal loan paid off, property number two. I think that can be turned into a good sustainable gen cash flow generator over the years. Um, number three, don't like number four. I think that's a reasonable housing price to buy. Um, $1,900 a month mortgage payment for your assets, for your net worth, for your income from some of these properties. Uh, but my biggest thing when it comes to real estate is you got to make sure you're setting aside money for these. And really, I guess my biggest thing is right now, I'm assuming this is all flowing in and out of the same bank account. Uh, yeah. So it's a reason for it. I know what you're going to say about it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to work on how to do it. So my biggest thing was um, I went VA on some of these houses, like several. So getting that into a business name and business account is a little bit more difficult, you know, miscalculations. So that Texas house um, that with the 341 you were talking about, that was a miscalculation uh, that I was holding on to thinking that, um, you know, more so trusting my team that's doing the property management that they uh, we're giving good guidance and advice. Um, and the market was going to increase. So they were saying that the numbers were increasing with, uh, people doing inquiries and that they should be able to do a property increase over there. I uh, really soon. Okay. Well, ho hopefully they can. And regarding not being able to create a business account, or whatever, you can't do that right now. Set up a separate personal checking account and put all your income, all your expenses for that in that account coming in and out of that. I mean, how I do is you have your personal account and then you have your real estate income and expenses account, and then you have, a, and that can still be in your personal name. Then you have a third account, which is a high yield savings account, which is your emergency fund for those properties. And you bring in however much monthly rental income, $12,000 for that month. After all expenses, it's, say you have $2,000 left over, let's put that $2,000 in that high yield savings account and everything else does not move out. So you just need to make sure that you're separating that out because right now, 
looking at your transactions, you got Airbnb payments, VRBO payments, all that coming into your personal account. You got Waffle House on the same transaction. And when you when you go and file your taxes for next year and you're trying to figure out these thousands of transactions, which is Home Depot for this rental property? What is Amazon for rental property? What is Amazon coming on normal house? You're going to be just killing yourself for trying to figure out where every single transaction is. So if you put those in separate accounts, okay, every single transaction that's an expense for the rental properties is coming in out of this debit card on this account. Every single income is coming in there. That will help you just at least understand, okay, this Waffle House is my on my personal account. So I don't have to search through Waffle House transactions to find the business transactions when you're trying to figure out your expenses for the year. So that'd be my biggest suggestion with that is you need to set up a formula or situation that works for you that you have all your personal stuff coming in somewhere. You have your rental property incomes and expenses coming in somewhere else. And then you have a emergency fund for your rental properties that you're not touching that is completely separate from the income and expenses, but it's leftover stuff that you're just putting aside. Like I said, maybe maybe you only start at 10% every single month, but work your way up to 20% and setting that aside to save for a rainy day. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. I mean, because I mean, you hit it on the head when you said like stuff happens to houses. I mean, stuff that you never expect. So I mean, having that rainy day fund. And then I think that it's reasonable to say, hey, just 10%, you know, that's fair. And then as the numbers increase, rent increases and whatnot, 20%, okay, it makes sense. And it's, it's possible. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm more conservative. So I want to be on the conservative side because 10% vacancy can hurt you. But if you put away 10% on all the properties every single month, that's emergency funds going to add up quickly. And Guess what? If something breaks on one of them, hopefully we're still cash on the other ones for that month and you'll be okay pulling from the emergency fund and not have to, um, or just from the cash flow from that month. So just things to think about when it comes to that. Personal loan, that is my biggest priority right now though. 15% interest rate on that. You got to figure out how to pay that thing off as quickly as possible because that is going to destroy you. Lowe's cards, I hate no interest rate credit cards. I hate buy now, pay later. And trust me, I I think the first two iPhones I bought a couple years ago, I did the hey, I'm going to finance $50 a month for the next 12 months or $80 or whatever it was. And I'm going to do this no interest rate thing because I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. I realized that I will not do that again. And I don't care. Maybe the only time I would do that is one day I'm going to go buy a Tesla for $100,000. And instead of putting $100,000 buying that Tesla, I can put that $100,000 in and I'll get it like a, theoretically, if interest rates are lower, I can get it for 0% for six years. Maybe I go put that same $100,000 into a rental property or put that $100,000 in index funds. But when you're trying to play the credit card game, something happens eight months from now, 10 months from now, your car breaks down or roof is leaking and you got to come out of pocket and stuff, you start putting on that, that interest is going to start accruing before you know it. And that's the last thing I want to do is you find yourself on in credit card debt because of stuff happening like that. So my thought process, especially with credit cards, if you can't pay it off in full that month, you shouldn't be using a credit card. I don't care if it's 0% interest rate. I don't care if it's 30% interest rates because a lot of people, I mean, credit card debt's over a trillion dollars in America now. And you know how many people, you know how many people with that trillion dollars probably signed up saying, hey, this is a 0% interest rate credit card. I'm going to pay it off before 12 months. Probably a good handful of those people. I can promise you there's millions of Americans out, Americans out there that said, hey, I'm going to use this credit card 0%, do a home renovation or do this, do that and all paid off before interest starts accruing. And guess what? Life happens and an emergency comes up or they decide to take a trip or whatever it might be and they can't pay that credit card off before the introductory period ends. So not a fan of those and you definitely want to get that paid off before March, April, and June. Um, right, those are the hot, the hot dates. And then the engagement ring. I would take, you got $10,000. I mean, see, this is this is the hard side of things. Right now you got $10,000 in your bank account. And I could say, hey, take that $10,000 and pay off this engagement ring tomorrow because that also scares me with $5,000 in your savings account when you got $1.7 million worth of real estate. So I would be figuring out, okay, what can you do before this statement ends at the end of October to pay this off? If you get that $3,000 in, we got to get this engagement ring paid off before the end of next month. Um, because the last thing I want to do is see you pay 20% interest rate on the engagement ring. And even if that means, hey, I'm going to take this money on my savings account to do that, I would look at that option. Um, but credit card debt, again, once you get that habit and you, you have that habit right now, it sounds like you kind of said, oh, I'm going to finance this engagement ring and I'm going to try to figure out a plan before that date comes. Again, things can happen. And once you start opening that door up to yourself saying, hey, I can carry a balance on a credit card or I'm going to put something on a credit card and I'll figure out how to pay it off. Again, you'll get yourself in that vicious cycle to start borrowing money that you don't need or buying things that you don't need and say, oh, I'll, I'll figure out how to pay it off later. And then they'll find you in a situation that isn't a pretty one. So my advice to you would be, of the next number one priority of the next 30 days would be 
engagement ring, paying that off. Then the personal loan, start taking action on that. And then you got a Lowe's cards. I want those paid off before March, all of it. I don't, I don't want more money going on that. Engagement ring definitely needs to go. And then between the personal loan and the Lowe's card, I start taking action on those um, quickly. Because again, I'm, I'm anti leveraging yourself like this with debt, with credit cards, with 15% interest rate loans. I mean, I was having a conversation with a friend that has a, if he's watching this, I don't know if he is, has a HELOC at 11% and it's a variable HELOC. So it goes up and down um, oh. with interest rates. Yes. In theory, he could earn his money when he took it out, it was at like five or 6%. Now it's at 11%. And I told him if it was me, I'd be paying that thing off as quickly as possible because that's a guaranteed 11% return on your money by paying it off. I was going to say the same way you feel about credit cards. That's how I feel about variable interest rates. Yeah. So I feel like it's something super dangerous, super dangerous. It, it is. It is. So I said to him, like, I would pay that off if I was you because I think obviously when you took it out, you didn't expect the Fed to hike rates and your interest rate to go up five, six percent. Um, but you also know what they're gonna do for the next 18 months, the next 24 months. And if you want a guaranteed rate of guaranteed rate of return, you can pay that off as quickly as possible and you get a guaranteed eleven percent. Yeah, that's I guess that's my current thoughts on your current financial situation. Um, but I wanted to kind of dive into any any questions of that initially or any thoughts? Um yeah, I mean, I definitely think that you opened my mind up to a couple of things. I, I might have to argue and still fight you on the uh, credit cards, but I do kind of think you have a really, really interesting point when you say I could take that stock portfolio and yeah, like kind of dump that to pay off that uh that personal loan for the ADU because I mean I would save myself essentially like thousands in interest at that point. And if I could do that, it's like no my stocks aren't like paying me in dividends, but I'm also saving here. So it's like looking at that balance and seeing you know what's more worth it and what's less risk. I think that that'll be the big catcher right there. Yeah, it it, it definitely is. In the credit card, if you want to play the zero percent interest rate credit card game. I can't stop you with that. As long as you get that paid off before March and then you stop playing that game after that, I'll be happy. Um, the personal loan and the game ring are definitely the first two in terms of priority because we still got six months till March. But again, you got to be making sure that you're saving money every single month for that. So, um, and the, yeah, the stock portfolio is definitely something just to, to think about. And that's anyone, anyone watching this. If you're watching this and you have a credit card at 25%, but then you got ten thousand dollars in investments. Why do you have ten thousand dollars investments that are earning at best in index funds probably seven to ten percent a year um, when you got credit card debt at thirty percent? That doesn't that doesn't math. It doesn't. And you're paying the bank's money to have money earn less in another account. And same way, some people are like, "Oh, I have a student loan that's at four percent, but I can put my money in a high yield savings account at four point five percent." Well, guess what? Your money in your high yield savings account is taxed at normal income tax. So between state and federal, you might be sitting at 25, 30% in total taxes on that 4.5%. So really you're earning 3% when you have a 4% loan. So again, you're losing money on that. Um, and those are things that people don't think about. Me personally, I don't. I wouldn't want to have that debt overlooming me when I could pay it off tomorrow and um, start paying it down tomorrow and and not have to worry about it. But let's Let's dive through some of these monthly payments. I'm going to have some different questions I know. Okay, okay. <laughs> Mass Mutual Insurance, $40. What is that? So that's whole life insurance. So that's more so like my safety net. I've been putting money there every month. So that way, if ever I do get in a bad situation, I'm like, hey, these tenants didn't pay or this accidentally broke down. I have all of that I could borrow from it uh, against it's my money that's growing that interest at that, uh, I forget the, the rate and it's growing. And most likely a high four, right? Um, it's growing at like, let's say four points, whatever. Um, I can borrow against it. No penalties if I don't pay it back and no interest at all. I'm going to challenge you on this real quick because every single personal finance person out there, who, who sold you on the whole life insurance policy first? My brother. Your brother. <laughs> so he's a whole life insurance salesman. Yeah. I think your brother's a great human being. I'm sure he is. Whole life insurance policies are not in your best interest. And I'll send you some resources after this. Um, Jeremy Schneider, he's at Personal Finance Club on Instagram. He has done a bunch of different posts on whole life insurance. Um, Ramit Sadie has done a lot on it, Dave Ramsey. But Jeremy Schneider did one. And I'm trying to find it. I'll send it to you after this. But it was something about whole life insurance and the what it's costing you over the life of the life of just over your life. Whole life insurance is typically a whole life insurance is typically ten times more expensive than a term life insurance policy. It also has returns you said four percent. So you're paying right now. I see the forty dollars, and then I see one hundred ninety one dollars. So you're paying two hundred thirty dollars a month in your whole life insurance policy. It sounds like correct. Okay, this is Jeremy Schneider's. Um, post. I'll read it right now. 
So it's talking about index universal life insurance. And he said he did, he read all 91 pages and did the math to compare its cash value growth to the returns of the S&P 500 index fund. And this was based on contributing $200 a month over the course of 40 years. The indexed universal life insurance policy had a total cash value of $320,000 at year 40. But the index funds had a value of $1.797 million at the end of year 40. So that indexed universal life insurance policy, in this situation, $1.4 million between the what well, the index funds value would be versus the indexed universal life insurance policy is. And that is typically because universal life insurance policies are commission-based salesmen and they get a fee for receiving that. So you're you're paying $230 a month, your brother's getting commission off of that. You stop the policy tomorrow, you call him up and say, hey, this guy I talked to you on the internet, said, hey, I need to cancel this policy. He's gonna say, oh, that guy's an idiot. And you can send him this post. And again, I think your brother's probably a great person. He's making a living, trying to make a living selling it. But when it comes to, I have no cat in this game. I have no cat in this game. I don't get paid if you cancel this whole life insurance policy. I don't get paid if you start investing index funds and turn into millions of dollars. I'm just trying to do what I think is in your best interest. Those are typically very front weighted um, with commissions. So you're paying a lot to commission broker fees instead of towards the actual policy itself. But in this post, it's showing that the index universal life insurance policy would end up about 37% of the value of the index fund. He said this analysis is a little bit difficult because he didn't actually own the policy. He had to go based on publicly available marketing information, which notoriously doesn't mention the huge associated fees. Austin just article, but typically if you're being index universal life insurance or any other type of perm life insurance, salespeople are trying to make claims to you saying, hey, this is an investment, but insurance isn't an investment. Insurance is insurance for a rainy day. Same way an emergency fund is uh, is insurance for when stuff breaks, insurance be treated the same way. You're not trying to get rich off insurance. You're trying to protect yourself. For example, if you when you get married and you die one day that your fiance has term life insurance or has funds to live and continue to live. So that's why people suggest term life insurance because if you take out a million or $2 million term life insurance policy, Again, typically it will be a 10th of the price of the whole life insurance policy. And if you die, that $2 million goes to your estate and can allow the partner to continue to live the way that they're living, or whatever that value is, value is. So just something to think about. I'll send you more resources on it, on whole life insurance policies. But that's one thing that I definitely see. I see it on TikTok. I see it on just the internet. I've had this debate with family members. I've had this debate with friends about whole life insurance policies. One in particular that is, I know is not watching this video, but if he sees this, I send him, I've sent him this uh, post before too. And just shows, Hey, how this, this can cost you over a million dollars over the course of your life. So just something to consider. Um, and I can promise you, if you have that conversation with your brother, initially he will be upset because he's losing his commission. So handle that situation as you please. But my point is to educate yourself more about whole life insurance policies, what the financial repercussions of that are. Obviously, past performance, the S&P 500 doesn't guarantee future returns. It allows you to just start looking at, okay, what if I'm putting this money towards paying this debt off quicker? That's probably what I do in this instance. What, is, what am I doing to do pay this debt off quicker? Or can I get a term life insurance policy that's $30 a month and then the extra $200? Hey, let's put that towards paying off this personal loan quicker. Or let's put this towards paying off one of these house loans that's seven or after we get the credit card payment, the personal loan, and the engagement ring paid off. Start using that $200 to pay off one of these properties quicker because it's a 7% interest rate on it. Um, but I personally, wait, it's not just 230. I see, okay, there's 40, there's 50, and then there's 191. So you're paying basically $280 a month towards this policy. So we got $280 that can be going towards partially towards a term life insurance policy, part of it towards paying all this debt quicker. Yeah, that, that, that loan, like you said, that biggest thing is really that, that personal off that ADU. I mean, it, I can promise that, you your whole life insurance policy isn't returning you 15%. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely correct. I think that that's a good way of looking at it too, actually. And again, term life insurance policy, it's for, term life insurance is for when you have dependents, depending on your income, depending on your livelihood. And if you something happens to you, if you die, then they're going to need money to survive. And that's why the goal should be, hey, get a term life insurance policy, whether it's for 20 years or 30 years or 15 years. But by the end of that term, having a stock portfolio, having a real estate portfolio, that would pay for your kid's life, for your partner's wife or life, um, and just allow you to know that if something happens to you, they're okay. And that's why term life insurance policy, you get a million, say typically get 10 to 12 10 to 12 X your income. So if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year, you get a million dollar policy, then that policy should last your partner and kids till they turn 18, they're out of the house and your partner can live 
with remaining funds of that and still continue to work whatever it might look like. But that will at least provide a bridge for getting kids out of the house and or um, living for the rest of their life if something happens to you. So that's why I'm a big fan of term life insurance policy with that. When you have dependents, when you have people depend on your income, whole life insurance policies, it's not in your best interest typically. Yes, there's some people that have debated me on this saying that, hey, I had a whole life insurance policy and due to health situations, I can never get a term life insurance policy. Maybe in that instance, it does make sense to keep that whole life insurance policy. If you cannot actually get a term life insurance policy, I would have to know more in the exact situation, but there might be instances like that that make sense. But if a salesman saying, hey, this is an investment vehicle, this is for you to build wealth and you can go and get a term life insurance policy, I would never suggest to get a whole life insurance policy. So so I can say, uh, and, and I, I guess I gave uh, bad information before, but that is for, I'm not sure to break down of which is which, but I know that is whole life and term life in that. I'm just not sure which is. Okay, so you don't need both. You can cancel the whole life and then you can just keep the term insurance then. Um, okay, let's look through the other stuff then. Because that was the first page. So that was a nice little tangent about whole life insurance policies. On page one, these look like different Airbnb incomes, lawn care. Yeah, I mean, again, this is top-notch pools. We got just everything just intermixed together, which, again, need to have that completely separate. Um, page your Apple Card, $2,000 in Apple Card purchases. Okay, now we're going to go through the Apple Card transaction. This looks like what most of your stuff goes through. It definitely looks like we're eating out more than $200 a month. What is Mo Ice Jewelers? $3,000. Uh, that was a part of the ring. Okay, so that's the engagement ring. We got burgers in Venice. We got Waffle House. Got more tacos in LA. So you're eating out a lot while you're in LA. Definitely more than Chipotle. $30 at Chipotle. Bojangles, 16 Definitely definitely a lot more than $200 on here. And yeah, this is only the first five days. Do you, do you budget your money? Do you track your spending? I can do a lot better. Uh, I'm going to say definitely based off of this last month, though, like traveling so much, I wasn't cooking uh, as much as I should have been. Um, I try to stay close to 200 and then 600 on groceries. But, you know, uh, given the last couple of months, like I, you know, haven't been grocery shopping. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking through I mean, most of these. I see some DoorDash stuff on here. I see your T-Mobile bill for $160. I see a Taqueria for $40. Liquor store for $70. Publix for 20 There's nothing like insanely crazy on here obviously the engagement ring was expensive so that's um we've already talked about that but in terms of your monthly expense it doesn't look like you're spending 800 dollars on entertainment like you said um granted this is only for the last 15 days so i'm missing some stuff on here so there might be other stuff on here that i don't i don't see um but my suggestions would be start budgeting your money you need to do two things. You need to budget your money personally. You need to budget your money on, treat all the real estate as a business as well, because you need to know your numbers, every single number on every single property. You need to know how much income is bringing every single month, how much you're setting aside for maintenance, how much you're setting aside vacancy, how much you're spending on repairs, how much you're spending on cleaning supplies. Um, you need to treat it like a business, whether it's in a business account or it's in a separate personal account. And then also on the personal side, you need to be budgeting your money and tracking your spending there because you need to set yourself with parameters to live because if you don't, if you're not intentional about your money, it's going to disappear just as quickly as it came in. If you're not tracking it, I mean, Tom Brady didn't go win seven Super Bowls without tracking any of his workout routines, any of his health routines, his eating. I can promise you that. And you're not just going to watch your way into building wealth by no one's, I don't think anyone's ever, no one's built wealth by living over their means. So you have to live below your means to build wealth. So, and if you don't track your spending, you're never going to know if you're living below your means. Trying to acquire more properties, if you're trying to start planning for a wedding, saving for a wedding, um, for this engagement ring, for house renovations, you have to be tracking your spending so that you know, okay, last month, I didn't just spend $600 on groceries and $200 eating out. I spent $1,200 eating out because I went to California that means I need to take it really chill this month and spend five hundred dollars on groceries and not eat out at all. Or hey, I know I'm going on vacation in November. That means October needs to be chill. That's what my wife and I do. When we know we have a vacation or something coming up, hey, we're gonna take it easy on the weekends. We're not gonna go out to nice dinners. Maybe we'll just get pizza for fifteen, twenty dollars because we know when we go on a trip, we want to go out to nice dinners and we want to spend. We're gonna eat out from Thursday to Sunday. Um, so we need to make sure that we're accounting for that. My suggestion to you is you need a budget on the personal side. And you need a budget on the business side. And on the personal side. Use something like men.com, Copilot, every dollar. I use men.com. It's free, easy to set up. Um, and then on the business side, whether it's QuickBooks, whether it's doing spreadsheets yourself, you can do that route too. There's a lot of different free templates out there too to track and organize expenses and P&Ls on spreadsheets. 
but you need to make sure you're doing that and just understanding where the money is going. So, no, yeah, I think that definitely could help out a lot. Of it. I need to call my fiance and hear some, she can hear some of this too. Uh, oh, Tyler, she can come on here and we can have a conversation with both of y'all next week. <laughs> Brady, let's talk about financial mistakes. You said you've had some different financial mistakes, some different nightmares with the properties. Could you touch on a few of those? Okay, well, first and foremost, I, I feel like you really hit on it a lot. Here you go, my fiance, that she just got over here now. <laughs> I would say the house in Texas, the one that, you know, uh, I, I definitely thought that I would be able to get higher rent in that area. And I, I think that it was bad timing. Uh, I'm more so was trying to take the opportunity while I could, uh, given like, you know, uh, options I had with the or opportunities I had with the VA home loan. I think that uh, today, um, I think that uh, the other thing was the, the construction loan I did for the ADU. I think the ADU could have definitely been a lot better had I got another quote or whatever. And I think a lot of my issues came from Rush. That I would have slowed down a lot more. That that would have definitely helped out, you know, a ton. How's it going? What what's your name? I'm Brittany. Brittany, nice to meet you, Brittany. Me and Clay have been talking all about finance today, so <laughs> did y'all talk about finances openly as a couple? We do. Yes. Okay. Nice. That's that's the way to do it because you got to know, you got to trust each other. You got to know what's happening. And um, money is one of the biggest root causes of divorce in America. And unless you're open and honest and talking about finances, it can cause a lot of issues. So what other financial mistakes have you made, Clay? Uh, so first was that uh, house in Texas, I would say two would be uh, just the, the rate I got on the ADU and then also the bid. I think he did an amazing job as far as the layout of it. I just think that maybe I could have got him go a little bit lower. My biggest issue with that though, and I don't want to get butts and ands and oars and whatnot, I'm going to say that that was a mistake, but if I did want to combat that, I would say a lot of people in Atlanta, you can't trust every single contractor. So I figured, hey, I know he will at least get the work done. So I paid more, but it was better than me paying to not have anything done. As far as the rate, um, Things shifted and changed a lot in the last year, I would say. I thought that I had to hurry up and build this because I was coming back home from a deployment, which ended up getting extended. So I didn't even come home right away. So I did have more time to wait. But given that all my houses were rented out, tenants were paying on time, they were paying good rates and amounts at the time. Um, and that was also before the taxes increased. I was like, hey, you know what? Uh, let me just hurry up and get this done so I can live in it. I'll be able to live rent free given that these other tenants are paying so high. But, you know have to evict those tenants and then uh yeah got stuck with the rate and yeah so that eviction i'm sure left you left you with some months without any rental income probably some costs on the eviction side as well exactly so um my i did get a handyman um that i have on my team he was able to renovate both places you know just for a couple thousand um he came in really fast and did it and then i was able to get a tenant they had moved in literally while they still were doing some repairs. Like some minor things, you know, but they, they came in, paid rent, and they've been rolling still. So good, good. You had a quick turnaround on that then. And it wasn't wasn't the worst nightmare story in the world then. So well oh, man, they left a lot. I mean, the, the thing is they they left a big mess. Like it was just like trash. Like I don't want to say hoarders, but uh I guess just like filthy. Just they didn't clean up ever. That was the biggest thing. It was just a lot of trash. That's a beautiful thing of tenants that people don't see on TikTok is uh what they can do to your property. I know someone that's trying to sell a property right now and the tenant has locked out the listing agent multiple times when they're trying to do showings. And I know other people that have had holes burned in their kitchen floors by tenants. So um, obviously there's a lot of good renters out there, but there's also uh, the other side of things, a lot of bad ones that can cost landlords a lot of money that people don't see. And that's why, again, why you need emergency funds and reserves set up for those. Um, Clay, we we'll really do appreciate you coming on here today. Um, my take and just advice to you, if I was in your shoes, would be one, you need to sit down and start budgeting more on the personal side and on the business side. Start tracking those expenses. Every single dollar that's coming in and out, you need to make sure they're doing that. You need to separate those first and foremost is having all the business expenses, all the business income, even if you're even if it is under your personal name in a separate bank account, just so you can see, hey, this is what's coming in and out there. And then on the personal side, you have your Waffle House and your eating out and Publix on that side. Um, but just make sure you're separating those so you can understand, hey, at the end of each month, I actually have $2,000 left over. I have $5,000 left over, whatever it might be on the business side. But right now, there's no way to look at your, your bank statements. There's no way to understand what's what's left over because it's all intermixed together. Three is we got to figure out how to get this personal loan paid off as quickly as possible. And you got to look at, look up your options, figure out what I want to do. 
um, with this, with a stock portfolio, if that's an option there or what you want to do there. A 15% is eating you alive with that. And once you get that paid off, it's going to open up $2,000 a month in cash flow in your real estate portfolio that you can use to go on trips with your fiance, or you can start using that money to start saving for a wedding if that's what you want to do. Um, but that loan, definitely a very high priority there. Um, and making sure you get your credit card debt paid off before the end of the month as well, because you don't want to be carrying a balance on that ever on the personal side or on the business side. And you don't want to do that come October. And then when it comes to Lowe's card, I know you like the 0% interest rate cards on those, but I start working out a plan because you got to start making a plan to make sure you're paying those off before then. And if, if that means if you sit down and say, okay, instead of paying these off by like next month or next two or three months, I'm going to pay the minimums and they're going to be paid off at March. And you're gonna take the rest of that money and start saving it in an emergency fund for the rental properties, then okay, that's a route that you can do. And I'd be okay with that. You go put that in a four and a half percent high yield savings account. Instead of paying a thousand dollars a month, you're paying like four hundred dollars where the minimum payment is. And then the other six hundred dollars, hey, we're gonna put this in a high yield savings account for when the roof breaks or when we have vacancies in our properties. Then and as long as the credit card debt's being paid off by that time period, then that's fine. And then guess what? If something happens in February of next year and um you can't pay out that credit card off in full, then, hey, guess what? You have that emergency fund saved up so you can pay it off at that time from the property. So you just have to make sure that you're budgeting, that you're creating a plan to pay off these debts. In this instance, it would be first priority is the credit card before it starts accruing interest at the end of the month. Then is the personal loan and then the Lowe's card is kind of how I would attack. Unless the Lowe's card starts accruing interest. Um, really sit down, start doing that, and then start saying, okay, I'm gonna set aside 10% of monthly rents towards an emergency fund try to up that up to 20% to account for vacancies and capital expenditures and just start setting yourself up for success there. Um, and I definitely understand, I understand the game of leverage. I, I very much do when it comes to real estate, you just have to make sure you're doing it calculated, doing it appropriately. 6% interest rate properties that are cash flowing. I'm not opposed to that one at all. The one that's in Decatur, that one's great. Looks like it's going to cash flow when you have those um, nicely, when you have the rental increases. The one in Texas, don't like that one because you're paying $350 a month for someone to live in there right now. So you got to figure out, can you increase that property? What rental prices or what can you do there? Um, and then moving forward, just don't take out 15% interest rate loans to to build things because that will that will hurt you a lot more than it can help you. So no, yeah, definitely. And I do appreciate it. I think you brought up a lot of really good points that like, you know, we'll sit down and talk over it, try to see how we can tackle those. Awesome. Well, I really do appreciate your time today. If you give one advice to someone that's, starting their journey in real estate or trying to start build wealth. I mean, you've done a great job building over $500,000 net worth by age 27. What advice would you give them besides leverage? <laughs> I would say take your time, you know, like really analyze the market and think about oh, worst case scenario. So like first start off and getting out there, you really want to be real conservative because you don't want to jump in the water and then get thrown out the second you hop in. So I would say definitely take your time. Yeah. I think that's great advice. A lot of people Want to get into real estate? They think it sounds good. No, I'm, I'm going to clear fifty dollars a month in cash flow, not accounting for any expenses. I'm going to use my entire emergency fund, entire bank account, and then they buy that property after closing costs. They have a dollar of their name, and then they don't get a tenant in the first month. Um, and I think a lot of people definitely jump into that. And it's like going into real estate. You have to have an emergency fund saved up. You have to have reserves because tenants don't pay. But guess what? You still have the bank money. Or tenants break stuff. Guess what? You got to pay for it. So that's my biggest concern right now for you is we've got the, these debts and then we don't have reserves and emergency funds saved up for these properties right now. And you got $1.7 million in assets. It's a lot of assets to not have a large enough emergency fund to cover those, to cover vacancies, to cover expenses. So um, obviously you're smart. You've been able to get this far, but I do think with some fine tuning with clearing some of this debt off and set up your systems a little bit better with budgeting and with um, just separation of business and the personal side of stuff, um, I definitely think you're well on your way to building tremendous wealth and um, a great real estate portfolio. So okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome, Clay. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, if you're still watching this, please hit the like and subscribe button and uh, we'll see y'all next time. Bye. Thank you.